And so another class that's a little bit of everything today. So we'll start in the seated position. And let's just start with the vagal release. And let's just do a really simple one, which is to pull on the ear. Pull outward in the shape of the ear. As you're doing this, you're assessing the tone of the ear, how stiff it is. So that often directs you to the side that is most dysregulated. And then go to the earlobe and pull down on the diagonal and slightly backwards till you can feel the skin and the fascia inside the eardrum. You're just pulling on that. So as you do that, you're stretching the auricular branch of the vagal system that goes into the ear, which then messages back to the brain just to balance. So same thing, 20 to 30 seconds, you're looking for the sigh, the swallow, the yawn, maybe a little bit more saliva in the mouth. All of these are reactions in the nervous system as it balances. So for me, I can feel there's more saliva and there's a bit of a swallow there. So about 30 seconds. So then just go to the other side and you're pulling out through the ear. Do it about three times. Could you tell which ear felt a little bit stiffer? Quite often, if you've got any neck issues, that might be the side as there's a little bit more tightness in the muscles, compression on the nerves. So third time down, you're pulling down on the earlobe, down in the diagonal and slightly backwards till you can feel the inside of your ear. So I've got a really quick swallow on that side. So for me, this must be the side that needs to be most balanced. So just stay there 20, 30 seconds. You could, you know, if you want to sort of multitask, you could be looking up at 10 o'clock, looking up at two o'clock, bringing the eyes as well. So often when you join things together like that, you're going to get a much stronger, better reaction. It just helps to sharpen your vision as well. It brings your eyes into more focus. And as that focus is increasing in the eyes, it's also increasing in the nervous system as well. Your brain is much more alert, much more focused, and now much more prepared to take in new information. So let's just start with the neck, an assessment with the neck, and just move the head. So the neck's where we've got most of our proprioceptors, nerves that send back messages to the brain about where we are in space. So just testing the other one side to seem a little bit stiffer. And then just come to the ears. If you put your fingers behind your ears and point inwards, C1, cervical one, is sort of at the back of the mouth. And then C2 is the vertebra that you can feel just below the rim of the skull. So we should always try to focus our movement from here. So let's just try nodding very slowly from C1 and C2. <clears throat> so, so often, we're moving our neck from C3, 4, mid-neck, and that's where we get into a whole load of trouble with the muscles. So C1 and C2 are a different shape, and they're specifically designed to be the, the point that our skull is moving from. As you do this, maybe take the fingers away from the ears, take two fingers of your right hand, just gently push at the front of the chin, and then you're looking up gently and you're just pushing into the front of the chin just to get that little bit more stretch in the suboccipital triangle. So the suboccipital triangle are the muscles, a triangular group of muscles that are supporting and stabilizing C1 and C2. So you quite often feel when you push your chin down just how tight you are in these muscles. So don't force it, but just gently imprint and, and repeat. So just by stretching these muscles as well, you're going to change these the cranial nerves that are coming out of the brainstem, not just the vagal system. Okay, so now let's try a rotation from just behind the ears. So again, if you're trying to twist your neck from halfway down, your neck muscles are not gonna be very happy. So if you feel discomfort doing this, you're going to be involving um, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, levator scapulae, trapezius. These are the muscles that you would look at. 
When we did the nodding, that's the capitus muscles at the back of the neck and the suboccipital triangle. So doing these little movements, good way to figure out which muscles are unhappy. Make sure your shoulders stay down. Feel like you're gently heavy in the shoulder blades and your shoulder blades are pulling down. So you've got that good alignment through the shoulder girdle. And then another movement you can try, pivoting from C1 and C2, is tilting the head. So this hinge of the jaw is moving down. This hinge of the jaw is moving up. So I can feel quite a lot of tightness even into my face muscles when I do this. I've got a particularly stiff neck at the moment. So just move at your 60% range. So remember, it is good to move these muscles, even though they are uncomfortable, but just don't try to do it quickly. Don't try to force them to stretch. Just use gentle repetition. So you're stretching the muscles, you're stretching the fascia, you're stretching the nerves that are within the fascia. So again, when you're doing this sort of movement, you're dealing with scalenes, the muscles in the sides of the neck, um, a little bit um, trapezius as well. Try pressing your tongue into the roof of the mouth. There's lots of really small muscles as well, um, pterygoid and um, epigastric. There's all sorts of weird names to muscles, that, small muscles that we don't even know about. So pressing, depressing the tongue into the roof of the mouth is just really a good way to connect with all these small muscles around the, the jaw, at the back of the throat, at the roof of the mouth. They all start to tighten up if the neck's uncomfortable. So then let's try another one, which is to just extend your neck forward. So we go into protraction, into neutral, into retraction. So we're tucking the chin, lift the head up and just move the nose between 11 o'clock and one o'clock. And again, these are the little tiny suboccipital muscles, those smaller muscles that we don't know the name of. And then come back into center. And again, just extend the neck. So you go out of it into neutral, into retraction. Keep the chin retracted as you take your head up. This is one of the most important movements you can do for your neck. It really keeps C1 and C2 nicely aligned. Come back into center. So one more time, protract, neutral, retract, looking up, gently moving. Couple more. Come back into center and bring the chin back down. Just do a few shoulder rolls. Reassess your neck. You might still find it's uncomfortable, but you should have more range. So now come to the sternum, come to the breastbone with your fingers and sort of interlace your fingers on the sternum. Drop your elbows. Keep your head looking at the, at the camera and just gently turning your breastbone to one side. So let's just say the left and you're moving the breastbone and the rib cage using the pressure of your fingers. So not so much coming from muscles, but using your bones. So these are Feldenkrai exercises. So Feldenkrai focuses on the skeleton to mobilize muscles, ligaments, tendons, fascia, nerves. Take a moment as you're doing this, just to think about how it feels. So we're using um, what's called the mediastinum. We've got a fascial connection from our heart and lungs to the front of the rib cage, to the back of the rib cage. It's called the mediastinum. And so it sort of like extends forward and extends backwards to keep the heart and lungs nicely supported in the rib cage. And as you rotate, you should feel a little bit of tension through this fascial connection. So maybe in your mind, you're looking at the back of the rib cage, mid thoracic. The more flexible we, be we become here, the more we relax our neck. Even our lumbar spine is affected by how stiff we are here. 
So now, now we've sort of got a bit of a feedback about this and we've got, we're sort of thinking about how it feels. Maybe we could use an in-breath. So as the in-breath pulls the diaphragm down, we might be able to go a little bit further. Still looking forward. A slow repetition. So maybe we're doing about 50 reps of this, you know, just sitting here. If you've been sat at the computer for a long time, it's just a nice antidote to that. So now we've done quite a few of those. Maybe now we're letting the neck move as well. We're still using the in-breath. We're still assessing how does it feel at the back of the rib cage. Maybe the front of the rib cage at the sternum, we're just a little bit more aware of the pressure of our fingers than we are the stretch of the fascial sac around the heart and lungs. One more. So the neck is all part of the spine. And so if what's below the neck is tight, that's going to radiate up into the neck. So I'll just do a bit of an assessment. So you might notice it's a little bit easier now to turn your head that way. So come back to the beginning to go the other way now. So interlace the fingers, drop the elbows, and you're looking forward and you're just gently moving the other way. And you're going to feel straight away how stiff that feels now compared to what we've just done. So Feldenkrais makes huge changes just by gentle repetition, talking to the nervous system through gentle movements so that your brain looks at the body and asks why is that place pretty stiff and uncomfortable and puts it back into high focus so that it actually starts to address things. So we can make bigger changes working through the nervous system than we can through stretching and through doing exercises. Stretching really doesn't impact the nervous system at all. The brain doesn't really register a stretch. Movements and exercise does. But when you do these sort of Feldenkrais type movements, then the brain really starts to take notice. So now add your in-breath, looking forward, and really assess how it feels inside the rib cage. Where, how do you feel it at the back of the rib cage, at the sides of your rib cage, at the front of your rib cage? Use that in-breath to go that little bit further. And do a few of those until that starts to feel easier. I'm definitely going further now. Still feels, I can still feel the tension, but my range is increased. And then when you're ready, add the head turn. Let the neck become integrated with the rib cage. Still using your in-breath. Although the head is turning, your focus is the breastbone. That's where the movement originates. One more. Come back into center. So now reassess. So suddenly now your neck will feel much freer. We could come back to the nodding from behind the ears, the rotation, level with the ears, the head tilt. For me, that's still a little bit stiff and sore, but it's I've got much more movement there now. And then the protraction, neutral retraction, 11 o'clock and one o'clock. Come back into center. Just do a few shoulder rolls. So that's all we're gonna do on the chair. So if we come off the chair now, we'll come to the floor. Bring the mat in. So come to sitting. Still with Feldenkrai, let's go from the neck to the pelvis now. So you've got your knees gently bent, you've got your hands behind your knees, and think of your hips like wheels that are rolling backwards. So quite often when we, we move at the hip, we're recruiting our spine and our back muscles. So maybe we're rolling from here, or maybe we're bending forward from here, when we should be hinging at the hip. So think of the wheel of the hips and just roll the wheel backwards, roll the wheel forward. And as much as you can, try to come out of your back. So, you, you know, I can feel I am still trying to use my back to do this. So keep your body fairly upright, nice straight spine, 
and roll from here, not from here. So it takes a little bit of practice just to really start to move your hips. And if you can really loosen up your hips and articulate at the hips, you're going to relax your back so much. Your hips are really pivotal for movement. Some of our biggest muscles are involved with moving the legs. And so if we can use our hips correctly, then we're gonna relax the back. So try not to round the back, stay fairly straight in the spine, roll from the pelvis, from the hips. You might find a few really tight muscles as you're doing this. So tight back muscles. It also, when you do this, when you learn to move from your hips more, you take a lot of strain out of the discs and the vertebra of the spine. So sometimes the spine is fairly irritated from always having to bend. So just like the neck, where we're trying to learn to come from C1 and 2, not C3 and 4, we're trying to come from the hips and not from lumbar 4 and 5. So that's where we get most of our problems. So the back will flex a little bit, but initiate the movement from the hip. So see now if you could hold one leg, one shin, take the other leg out and see if you could still roll through the hips. A little bit more focused. So you're a bit more aware of the straight leg hip. Nice straight spine, so you're not slumping into the spine. Good, some really good low ab, low back work going on in the muscles. And I'm really starting to become aware of my hip muscles now. They're actually starting to fatigue a little bit. So that's a good thing as well. So we've got that feedback coming back into the brain. And so again, we're recruiting muscles. We're relearning how to fire up and initiate movement. So it's novel brain experience, and it's just telling the brain, look, this is the way. So I can feel this hip now, it's actually quite tired. So switching over, and that's my lazy hip, so that's a good thing. So again, so now we're rolling, so if I was to turn, now we're rolling through this straight leg hip. You're supporting yourself on the shin. You're not rounding your back, so you're trying to keep your back as straight as possible so that it doesn't jump past the hip muscles into the back. So we're trying to keep our shoulders really up, long in the neck, long in the spine, and we're rolling through the wheel of the hip, rolling. I think it helps a bit to pull your toes up so you just connect with that whole leg a little bit more. So really relearning how to recruit muscles to you know, get rid of some faulty postural patterns, habitual patterns that we're using. So if these muscles are really strong and dominant in our body, then the pressure is taken off the back muscles. They will do it if they have to. So if we're in the garden and we keep bending and we're doing things wrong, the back muscles will take over, but you know, it's really uncomfortable. So you keep going. So I'm starting to feel fatigue now in the muscles around the hip complex. So if you're feeling that fatigue, that's a really good sign. That means the brain is really talking to these muscles, they're talking to the brain, and you're not using your back muscles, you're not compressing discs in the spine, you're not irritating the nerves that come out of the spine. A couple more, so I'm just gonna keep going till it feels the same level of fatigue in this hip, as it did in the other. So that's about it now for me. So maybe now just do a little bit of a shake out. So coming into cross legged, and we're going to just um, stretch forward, but as you stretch forward, think belly button forward. And just gently move into neutral and then moving forward. So this is a stretch now to those muscles that we've just worked. So you're stretching forward. So again, still fells and fry. Stretching forward. And you're moving forward through your belly button so that you're in an anterior tilt. You're not allowing the back to work. You're stretching your rotators at the back of the pelvis. So we'll do a few.
I'm really tight in these muscles. So eventually you should get that as you reach forward, you might even be able to lift your bottom slightly off the floor. That's not going to happen for me because my hip muscles are really tight and I've been in the garden for two days, so they're super tight at the moment. But just doing this belly button forward, you're getting that lovely stretch through the muscles at the back of the pelvis. So it's a nice way of doing what would be like a pigeon stretch without affecting your knee. So pigeon stretch is one of my favorite stretches, but people with knee issues don't like it because it really stretches their knees. So this is doing the same thing. You're stretching your glutes, the nine gluteal muscles. So try changing the front leg. So we would have chosen our favorite leg. So see what we're like now on our not so favorite leg. So again, leaning forward, belly button moves towards the end of the mat. You're not moving down into a flex spine, you're in an extended spine. So I can really feel some of these really unusual little muscles, gluteal muscles, obturators, internus, gemellus, small muscles that get very tight, but we don't really know about them. We know about the piriformis because that's the well-known one, but we don't know about the others. And so I can feel these are super tight. So if you've got SI joint issues, then you know these muscles are going to fire up. Your belly button forward. So you do 10 to 20 of these. So like I say, it's a sort of a modified pigeon. Nice long straight back. That's one. And then you could just do a little bit of a knee bounce as well. So bouncing the knees does the same thing. The muscles are stretching. Just make sure it's a comfortable bounce. You're not forcing anything that's tight. And then you could switch the legs over again and you could do it with the other legs. Okay, so that's one for the pelvis and for the hips. So our hips now are really talking to the brain. So let's come now to the balls, two balls in a sock, a little bit of a space in between them. And let's just come into um, TFL in the side of the pelvis. So we've got the elbow under the shoulder and we've got the balls together under the, the, the sort of the midpoint of the pelvis. So if you just orientate the rim of the pelvis, the greater trochanter, which is the bump at the top of your leg bone, the femur comes up on a diagonal line and then you've got that big bump that sticks out at the top. That's your greater trochanter. So we're sort of just between the greater trochanter and the rim, right in the middle, and then you're just gently rolling and you could be lying flat or you could be on your elbow. You could put a big pillow under your, your rib cage if you want to. And um, I'm going to lie flat. And if you take the legs into straight, that's also going to bring in a little bit more tension and just roll from front to back. It's a little bit different than the roller. You can feel that, um, you know, it's a little bit targeted. So we've got... TFL at the front, we've got glute minimus above the, the greater trochanter, glute medius at the back. So just give that a little bit of a, a work out there. So lying flat um, is a little bit less. Coming up onto the elbow, you've got to make sure the elbow's tucked in, the shoulder's relaxed. You could do a bit of scrubbing. So these are big, strong muscles and um, they're quite fibrous. So if you go cross fiber, you're going to help them to relax a lot quicker. And then let's come down the side of the leg and we want to be in the middle of the outer thigh. So I'm going to have my top leg straight and I'm just going to be in the middle of the outer thigh with those two balls. So we've got three triggers in the middle zone. So if you split the outer leg into three zones, in the middle zone, you've got three triggers. And so they're quite gnarly, they're quite nasty. So if you don't put too much weight on the ball, but you just have the knee off the floor and you just move your leg, you can, again, you can scrub across that band and you can gradually come down. You're gonna find these triggers. So the triggers are really in the outer quadricep. So, vastus lateralis so it's a hard working muscle stabilizing the knee in walking and so it's going to get a little bit irritated so you're going from the middle of the outer thigh 
and you're working downwards towards towards the knee and you're going to find quite a bit of activity there so find where it's most painful that's where it's most productive it's not our favorite thing to do and then maybe we could go to the top of the calf just below the knee and we could just sort of work into there a little bit as well so that's our our posterior tibialis it's going up and down the outer calf and then if you turn your toe towards the ceiling we've got two two biceps we've got two heads that make up the calf outer calf muscle and you're just on the outer the outer one so if you if you come to the to sort of this point press with your thumb just use one of the balls in the sock and just give that a little bit of attention you could actually you could actually separate the balls and you could do one on the inside and one on the outside so you're about a hand space down from the knee they're easy to find because they're pretty sore you could just point and flex your toe so calves super hard working muscles so these triggers are almost universally upset and tight so for me the inner one is a little bit more unhappy than the outer one so the, the calf muscle comes up from the heel and goes into two heads so you've got a trigger point in the belly of the outer one and a trigger point in the belly of the inner one and um, doing this is just really going to help the whole of your superficial back line relax and then if you were to measure from your heel about a hand space up right in the middle so you could put the you could stack the balls you've got your Achilles tendon trigger and you could just you could do it either way actually let's try it that way yeah it actually works better to go that way rather than vertical and just so about a hand space up just where the tendon branches into the muscle and then you've got another trigger point here oh this one's sore so if you've been doing a lot of walking this one gets really really tight if you wake up in the morning and you find it hard to walk at first it's because your calves have tightened up so just you know two minutes here and immediately that whole of your back of your body is relaxed so it affects your back as well as your legs so let's do the other side let's go to the other side so we're going to go into the tfl the side of the pelvis so remember we find the rim of the pelvis we find the great jacanta we go right in the middle you can be up on the elbow, which is a little bit more challenging, or you can be lying down flat. Start lying down flat is probably a good way to go. And you're just rocking, you're rolling your pelvis forward and back. Now I'm on my tired side, so immediately active triggers. The other side was fairly happy, this side not so much. So at the front, tensha fasciolata, the tightest place in the body. In the middle, glute minimus at the top of the greater trochanter. Glute medius is usually this trigger point here is usually the one in glute medius that's the most active. It's sort of in the deep part of the muscle. So start by lying down and then you can come into elbow under the shoulder and you could do a little bit of scrubbing. They're big muscles so that you can be quite aggressive with them and they actually like it, whereas other parts of the body, we might need to be a little bit more careful. So just find what feels good. If you straighten the legs, there's more tension in the muscles. So you get a little bit more feedback. So at least a couple of minutes because these are really, really unhappy places. If it's tearful at the front, you can bring your knee forward and just come into that half turn position and just really get into it. So this is universal trigger point number one. So it works every time we walk, we lift one foot off the floor, this muscle tightens up. So it's guaranteed to be tight in almost 100% of the population. And 
you put the ball there, you can suddenly start to feel. It takes a while for the muscle to yield. So once you find it, I'm doing a little bit of scrubbing because this side is a lot tighter. So if you've got SI joint dysfunction, you're looking at, for the side. One side is lazy and maybe hypermobile. The other side is really tired and overworked because it's trying to create stability. So this is the side you're identifying and then you're just trying to help it to relax. So then we went to top leg straight, bottom leg bent, and we're coming into that middle zone. So split, split the outer thigh into three zones. We're in the middle zone. There's three triggers, one, two, three, and you're just gonna move your leg up and down, your knee up and down. A particularly nasty one. But the good thing is two balls in a sock is a much better way of doing this than the roller. The roller is usually too painful. Whereas the ball, you haven't committed too much weight to the ball and you decide how strong it's gonna be. You could also press with your hand and you can work downwards towards the knee outer knee and just figure out where the painful places are. So the main triggers are in the middle, but there will be some satellites around the knee as well. So go back to where you figured out it was the most uncomfortable. If your neck's uncomfortable, being upright, you can lie down, just relax into it. You could put a big pillow under your rib cage. That just helps your upper body relax so that you're not stressing above the area that you're working. So the longer you're here, the more <laughs> the triggers become evident. So if you're doing this, you know, at home on your own, you, you spend a bit more time here. I'm just going through the, the sequence, but um, if you found something unhappy, then stay there. So then we're coming to um, the car and we decided that we'd put the balls one either side you find the two biceps, the two round heads at the top of the calf, about a hand's face down, spread the balls wide, and then you can hit both of those triggers at the same time. And all you'd need to do is just point and flex your toe. So you're contracting your calf and then you're relaxing and stretching. And just use that torsion just to get a little bit of a quicker release. You're just doing your calves on your own is just going to make the whole of the back of your body feel much more relaxed, more balanced. And then we came about a hand space up from the heel to where the Achilles tendon branches up into the muscle. And you could do a little bit of scrubbing. You could go cross fiber. You could just point and flex. If you use just one ball out of the two, you'll find the trigger point in this place a little bit easier. So we've got one here, but two up here. So you only need one for the Achilles trigger point. You can get rid of Achilles tendonitis just by doing this. And it makes such a big difference. So when you've got Achilles tendonitis, there's too much tightness in the calf, it's pulling on the tendon, it's inflaming where it attaches into the heel. So if you can relax the calf, release the pressure through the tendon, then everything starts to calm down. And just wear a shoe that's really well supported so that the heel doesn't roll inwards and outwards. So I found Birkenstocks, my little advert for Birkenstocks, are a really good solution to Achilles tendonitis because they stop your heel from pronating and supinating. So that's your calves. So let's come to hamstrings now. So same leg, just in front of the sit bone and just, um, just sort of scrub your body so you could just move. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna do it slightly differently. I'm gonna go long ways. So just below the sit bone and I'm going to do an anterior tilt. So I'm just keeping my back really straight and I'm thinking belly button towards big toes. And really this is focusing on the middle hamstring sort of the, the big strong one down the middle. And then there's two either side that come down and, and open out into a sort of a V to come into either side of the back of the knee. So a lot of tension here. And you can gradually work down 
So belly button to big toes, don't bring in the spine. As you do it this way, your sit bone pulls backwards as you move the pelvis forward and that stretches your hamstrings. So it gives you a torsional release and you're coming down. So as you come past the midpoint, then you come to the place where you've got three hamstrings, you've got one in the middle, one going to the inner knee, one going to the outer knee. So as you go beyond the halfway down point, you're coming into those other two hamstring muscles. So just move down until you feel that you've got them. And then you could just um, you could just do like a windscreen wiper movement across the three heads. You could point and flex. You could do a few anterior tilts. Really the best way to do hamstrings is sitting in a chair. You get a little bit more pressure. It's very hard to apply a lot of pressure lower down. You could use your hands. So try the other side, just below the sit bones. One eye, let's spread out, open the balls out a little bit. Anterior tilt. That middle hamstring is really big and strong. So you're going to be really pressing on it coming down. And you're moving the balls down a little bit at a time. And again. So I'm about halfway down now. So this is where the two, the inner and the outer hamstrings start to branch out. And now you sort of start to feel and also angle your toes. If you turn your toes out and in, you're going to find the inner and the outer hamstring. So for me, the inner one <laughs> is pretty unhappy. I can feel I found a really nasty trigger point here. Now you just keep coming down, but you don't go into the back of the knee. So that's never a good thing to do because we've got blood vessels there. You can have cysts. We have all sorts of anomalies in the back of the knee. So we don't go into that. We're above that, about hand space up from the back of the knee. So for me, definitely this inner, inner hamstring is particularly unhappy. So if you found something, just stay there, just work on it. So I'm turning my toe in. You might be turning your toe out if it's the outer one. And I'm just doing a little bit of scrubbing, using my body to move. I'm doing a little bit of pressing. Okay, so if you need a pillow for your head, you're going to, I'll turn around this way again, you're going to put the pillow there and we're going to lie down and we're going to put the two balls under the sacrum and we're going to come just to the middle of the sacrum. So let's just put the hands on the pelvis. So we're really pressing on Trigger points for glute medium, mid, sorry, maximus, and also piriformis, and we're on the SI joints as well. So we're just doing little pelvic tucks. It's a really lovely place to go to with balls because there's so much activity here. So you're decompressing the two SI joints. You've got trigger points for glute max, the biggest of the glutes. And piriformis, it's not usually the most active trigger for piriformis, but it is there in this place. So you're just doing little pelvic tucks. You could add in a knee lift, alternate the knee lifts and just keep your pelvis steady. So maybe you are slightly pulling up through the pelvic floor, slightly engaged in the abdominal muscles below the belly button. There's a nice little technique where you feel like you're pulling your hips closer together, a bit like an airplane seat belt that's very low across the hips. So you feel like that belt is tightening, pulling the hips in, the ASIS in, and it just means you're activating transversus abdominis. You're pulling up through the pelvic floor, that's making you recruit multifidus, the small muscles of the back. If you imprint your belly button towards the low back of the rib cage, you're using your upper abdominals and slightly into psoas and diaphragm as well. 
So now just take those two balls and take them up to the top of the pelvis, either side of the, um, the sacrum. So this is your PSIS. It's the highest point at the back of the pelvis. It's the top of the SI joints. So again, it's a really lovely place to work. Just start with some gentle pelvic tucks. <clears throat> We've got a lot of conflicting um, functions here. We've got back muscles coming into leg muscles, walking muscles, pelvic muscles, SI joints, L5 into S1. So we've got change of function here. So this is where we get the conflicts. This is where we get problems at these joints. So this is the best place to go to if you've got SI joint issues. So right at the top at L5, S1. And again, we could do knee lifts. So just putting pressure here just allows the joint to relax a little bit, to decompress. So again, you're activating your powerhouse. You're pulling up through the pelvic floor. You're feeling like you could pull the ASIS, the highest point at the pelvis at the front, inwards using that imaginary airplane seatbelt. And you're just gently pulling your belly button towards the back of the rib cage at the low ribs. So your powerhouse is active, your pelvic muscles, your abdominal muscles are all turned on and are working for you. So now let's just go to a little bit higher, pull the balls out quite wide. There's a ligament here. So there's a lumbar, lumbar um, pelvic, hang on, I'll get the name of it. I always forget the name of this one. So it's your sacro-lumbar. So sacro-lumbar ligament here. So there's a ligament that goes sort of on a diagonal at this point. You might notice a little bit of tenderness. So you're just above the rim of the pelvis with the balls pulled out as far as they'll go. So at least, you know, two fingers apart. And just see how it feels with a little bit of pressure here. So if you've got anything going on with the pelvis, if there's any torsion in the pelvis, any twisting, this ligament might be a little bit unhappy. So this is your lumbar sacral ligament. We've got another ligament as well, which is the sacrotuberous ligament. If you were to go just above the sit bones, pull the balls out as wide as they'll go, so about two fingers apart, we've got a, a ligament that runs from the sit bone to the sacrum here as well. So again, little pelvic tucks. So in large you know, amounts of population, nothing at all going wrong here. But if you've got any twisting in your pelvis, these ligaments on one side maybe are really tight, really unhappy. You do some little knee lifts. So you're drawing, you're just above the sit bones, Ball's quite wide, and it's a place that you'll, if it's a little bit tender, you'll know, yes, you could do a little bit of a leg extension or a knee circle here. So it's the sort of place if you're doing um, trigger point work on people, you can really push up into this and give people a lot of relief, but you can do this with a ball. So I'm doing a knee circle into a leg extension. I'm using my abs. So this is your sacrotuberous ligament. So it goes from the sacrum to the sit bone. And then the one, the one above the rim of the pelvis is your, I still have to remember the name because they're similar to each other, is your sacrolumbar. So it's going from the sacrum to the lumbar spine. And um, you can just try that one again. So from here, let's just move the ball up about two centimeters at a time, paraspinal, so either side of the spine. So we've got the big lumbar vertebra. They're, they're a good sort of um, three to four centimeters deep, each one of them. And they've got bony processes that come out at the side and wrapped around those bony processes is your erector spinae, your big, long, deep back muscles. So coming up either side of the spine is just a really, 
lovely thing to do. The back really loves this release. So pelvic tucks. You could put your hands under your bottom if you find the drop to the floor is just a little bit too much for your spine. You could do knee lifts if you think that feels good. You could do knee lift, knee circle into a leg extension. So now we're bringing in some abdominal work. Steady the pelvis with your hands. And if you're doing the leg extension, you're pulling up through the pelvic floor. You're imprinting your belly button. You've got that airplane seat belt pulling the hips in. And you're just doing about four on each leg. So I can feel referral into my hip on this left side. And I get quite tight in my groin on the left side because this is my dominant side. So these triggers in the erector spinae. So you're coming up two more centimeters. So you're sort of hopefully working between two vertebra and the disc in between them as you come up two centimeters at a time. Keep your pelvis level. So support it with your hands. Use your powerhouse so that your back is not rolling. So you're really just articulating the hip in the hip socket to create a little bit more pressure on the balls. And again, you're coming up again. When you get to just below the ribs, uh, the low ribs, T12, thoracic 12, just be careful. Don't put too much pressure on that low rib at the back. So you could put your hands under your pelvis. Just do some gentle pelvic tucks. So those low floating ribs are not as strong as the other ribs. And so you just need to be gentle. So there's trigger points here in your quadratus. So then you're going to lift your bottom up and roll the balls up again two more centimeters. So you're sort of on T, T10, T11. I suggest putting the hands under the pelvis again so that there's not too much pressure or you could put a pillow there. So the lower third, the lower quarter of your rib cage, you've got 12 vertebrae in your rib cage. So 9, 10, 11, 12, you're just being very gentle. You're not allowing your whole body weight to press onto the balls. You don't need to. And just using gentle pelvic tucks. So once you get to about T9, T8, then it starts to feel more comfortable. You can maybe then also put your bottom on the floor and just do the gentle pelvic tucks. Check that your neck feels okay. You might need to put some support under the head. So this lower thoracic area, you can be super, super tight. So you've got a whole load of conflict coming where the vertebra change from thoracic vertebra into lumbar vertebra. You've got low ribs, muscles in the rib cage that are super tight. You've got big back muscles in the upper back. So just see how it feels. So then you could, at this point, you could start to just roll your body down about one centimeter. So I'm sort of just below the bra line now. Pelvic tucks. Again, if you prefer, put the hands under the bottom just to give yourself a little bit more control. I've made a sort of a triangle with my thumbs and my fingers. So I've got a nice broad base. So you shouldn't be moving into pain. You should be just feeling nice pressure. So as you come, you're rolling the body down again, another two centimeters, just watch your jumper, doesn't get caught, your top. So at this point, you could be adding in a little bit of arm floating. So as you float the arm, you can feel there's a little bit more load, a little bit more pressure on the ball. Single arms to begin with, you could try double arms. You could do what they call jazz arms, which is where you reach to the ceiling and then release, reach. They call that jazz arms. You could reach across, reach across. 
So again, you're moving your body down another couple of centimeters on, sort of just above the bra line now. We've got the cap joining in the class. So go back to the single arm floats. Maybe that's a double arm float. You could add an in breath as well, just to get a little bit more extension, a little bit more expansion through the rib cage. You could add the jazz arms. But the jazz arms are definitely the strongest because as the arm reaches up, the other side presses down into the ball. So it's sort of lovely, but it is definitely stronger. So now we're coming up between the shoulder blade. So there's a whole load of muscles here. So this is where you might want your head on a pillow. I didn't get myself a pillow, so I'm gonna to have to manage without. But you maybe want your head lifted. And you're just gonna do again the single arm float, the double arm float, the jazz arms. So make sure the neck is supported. If your neck is too active, then your lower muscles will not relax because the neck will just dominate. So you're coming up again. So I'm right in between my shoulder blades now. Really nice place to be. And again, single arm float. Single arm float. Double arm float. Jazz arms. You could link your fingers behind your head and you could do a little bit of a head float. A bit of a sway with the head. So you're moving down again another couple of centimetres. Your body moves down, the balls roll up. Having them in a sock means they're not going to roll away, they're, they're going to stay where you want them to be. They're less slippery as well if they're in a sock. So again, you're doing the single arm float, the double arm float, the jazz arms, or you're supporting the head, and you're doing a sort of a sway, you could do a figure of eight. So here we're in a whole load of muscles, we're into um, serratus, um, superior serratus in the back of the body, we're into um, trapezius, we're into rhomboids, and then we're coming down again. So as the body moves down, now we're at the top of the shoulder blades, inner edge. So this is levator scapulae. Open the balls out a little bit. So you're in that sort of diagonal line of the shoulder blade. And again, you could do the single arms, you could do the double arms, you could do the jazz arms, you could support the head, and you could just do some gentle head lifting. So the levator scapulae, very active part of the neck. So again, so now no more rolling the body down, just move the balls with your hand and you're at the level of the shoulders, just below the level of the shoulder, as wide as you can with the balls. This is trapezius trigger point one. So this is, this is universal trigger point number two in the body. And so you're trying to pin the balls. So a nice thing to try here would be bring your feet fairly close to your bottom and just gently lift your bottom and lower your bottom. Make sure the pillow under your head is comfortable for the neck. If the neck feels uncomfortable as the bottom lifts, then take the pillow away. So as you lift your pelvis, you're pushing into the balls and you're really pinning that very, very active trigger point. So it feels lovely. It's better than doing it with the roller. We usually do this with the roller, but the two balls is much more targeted. Feels really good. So if you can't get someone to give you a shoulder neck massage, then do this yourself and you'll find it feels really great afterwards. One more. I could stay here for five minutes, it feels so good. So now just take those two balls and bring them up to the rim of the skull, as wide as they'll comfortably go. So at least two finger space. And let's just do the suboccipital muscles again. 
So maybe you hold the balls in place and you're just nodding. You're moving your nose up and down. You move your nose right to left. So we're in the sub-occipital triangle. You can come above the rim. There's muscles here, occipital muscles here that get super tight. If your neck is fired up, unhappy, then it even goes into these muscles of the skull. So occipital muscles above the rim, suboccipital muscles below the rim. And then you could even come down one vertebra into C2, which is about two centimeters down from the rim of the skull. And just do some nodding side to side. You do nose circles. So this is right into the middle of that triangle. It's okay to do it with balls, but you wouldn't do it with anything too hard. And you wouldn't lift your bottom while you're doing this. Just, just enough to do it with your bottom on the floor. If you can stretch the balls wider now, just to the the rim of the skull at the mass at the mastoid process. So again, there's a lot of activity here. You can feel the skull comes down a bit here, just at the back of the ear. You can feel that's the lowest part of the rim of the skull. So just work around that rim. Nodding side to side, some sort of circle. Messes the hair up a little bit, but it just feels really good. A little bit longer, we're nearly there. And then just take the balls away. So we'll just bring our knees in, just hug our knees, bring our head into our knees, just see how the spine feels after that. Swing up into sitting, and let's just finish with a very quick mermaid. So into a triangle, we're just going to come up and over. We didn't really get much for the side of the body. That's good, up and over. One more. And then switch the legs around. So hopefully the hips are feeling nice. Up and over. Up and over. Last one. And then coming into cross legged and just rolling at the hips and just moving forward, belly button moving forward, just stretching those tight muscles at the back of the pelvis. Hopefully they feel a little bit freer. Maybe eventually you can get where you can get the sit bones as you come forward to lift. I'm almost there, but not quite. I'm not gonna force it. And then switch the legs over. Belly button moving forward, stretching those muscles. So when you come to stand now, you should be feeling much more balanced in your pelvis, in your hips, and hopefully the neck's feeling freer as well.